Hi, everyone, and welcome to a recording on the seven key numbers that every single small business owner must know. Now, this recording is particularly for and primarily for our Clarity community members. So those accountants, bookkeepers and advisors who are helping small business owners with their numbers. We specifically want to record this so that you could share with your team to be able to help your team understand the seven key numbers, how they relate to one another and the discussion points that flow from that but it's also helpful as a quick reminder for you too. And perhaps we might uh, share some uh, strategies or, or points that maybe you hadn't thought about. And again, if you come across any points that you think we should be talking and sharing with our community, then please do let us know. Of course, you'll get access to the slides as well so that you can share with your team and use as a supplement to this. Um, and um, you can adapt them for, for training for your clients if that's something, a webinar that potentially you wanted to run as well. So just a brief introduction, if for whatever reason you're not aware of Steve and myself, I'm the CEO, grandly entitled CEO of, of Clarity, our wonderful lean startup. Um, and Steve is our chief of ops. Hey, Steve. How you doing? How you doing? Thank you, Heinz. So for contacting us, it's, 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 uh, we're, we're pretty much all over social media. Um, and um, obviously just contact us through our usual channels. You know how to get in touch if you've got any queries about this. I uh, just a rough agenda about what we're going to be talking through today. So we're going to be looking at what the seven key numbers are. We're going to be talking about how they're calculated so that you get a feel for the calculation methodology and also understand what issues might arise in your client's records because of that calculation. Because oftentimes when we want to have that conversation, we still can continue the conversation, but we maybe just need to caveat some of the things we're saying based on the underlying records. So for example, uh, accounting for long-term contracts or where in the period we're, we're looking at the numbers or how, you know, what information goes in to actually generate that, uh, con that, that number for that specific client. And perhaps there are vagaries that we need to take in account, into account. But in general, these are the same discussion points we'll have with all clients. The same points will flow and the same connectivity between the numbers. So um, it's pretty much good to go. We also want to discuss why these numbers are so important for your clients and how you can help your clients uh, play with those numbers, sensitize them, see what's possible within the business and the potential profit and cash improvement. And again, so that we can show our clients what's possible within their business, what potentially we can help them with and what they can actually help themselves with and forms part of a wider conversation. Now to just put this into context, you've seen before us talk about the main challenges facing small business owners. And the reason we're looking and going through in detail with the seven key numbers is because small businesses have a really poor understanding of financial data in general. Oftentimes they'll nod at us and we assume they understand what we're talking about, but in general terms, they don't really get their numbers. And so we need to help them with their numbers. And Clarity has been born from that making business simple making it easy for business owners to understand their numbers and for us to be able to talk to them about their numbers. So again, just to put that into context as to why we're discussing these seven key numbers. And it's also important for you to understand that we're starting with a numbers led conversation because small business owners come to us and expect us to talk to them about numbers and numbers is what we're really comfortable with. Lots of great business points flow from these numbers. So don't get too worked up about the business element to a lot of these numbers, this will naturally flow from your conversations and your clients should pretty much have most of the answers in any event. So we're gonna dive straight in, enough preamble, lots of discussion points are gonna flow. Stevie's gonna lead the conversation and I'm gonna chip in um, and do some editing job with slides and screens for you so that we can easily uh, understand and share the information. So um, if you just, Bear with me two minutes while Stevie starts talking to you. I'm going to switch over to the Clarity 7 key numbers slide screen. Ethan. Thank you. And as Ainsley is saying, that what we're doing with the seven key numbers, uh, these are relevant to every single business. And what we wanted to do, you'll see in a moment within Clarity, is that we're looking at the P&L, we're looking at the balance sheet and cash statement and efficiency within the business. So it's really important to have that holistic view of what's going on. As Ainsley mentioned, numbers tell us what's going on. Numbers are the language of business and they tell us what's going on within the business so that whether something's going in the right direction or if it's going in the wrong direction, we can deal with it. And it's so important that we're using these with our clients, as Ainsley alluded to, 
Our, our clients don't necessarily have the time to look at the numbers if they do understand them, but otherwise they don't understand the numbers. And that's where we come in as their trusted advisor, if you want to call it that, as accountants to be able to interpret the numbers for them uh, and, well, we understand them and then we can interpret them. That's the superpower that we have as accountants. So it's up to us to work with them, with the technology and with process to help them and to understand what's going on in their business and help them improve and then grow their business as well. So you can see here on the screen that there's, there's seven. So the whole idea here is keeping things as simple as possible. As we said, some people don't understand numbers. Um, so we want to keep things as simple as possible, but we're looking holistically, as I alluded to a moment ago. Just a quick run through of the numbers, just so that we can see clearly on the screen, we've got revenue growth, gross profit percentage, operating profit percentage or EBITDA percentage. We have revenue per employee. We have core ca cash target. We have cash days uh, and business return. Now, each of these numbers tells a story. And some are more holistic individually than others, but uh, altogether they are holistic as well. But they will point to a direction in terms of a discussion point with the client. So the first, the first number, let's, let's take things uh, from the very beginning. The first one we have is revenue growth. Now, um, forgive me if I'm teaching you to suck eggs. We're, we're make, making no assumptions here in terms of, of, of the numbers. So if you do know some of these, um, then you, this is more of a benefit for your team who don't potentially but we're gonna go through these each in turn. So what is the revenue growth? Well, that's looking at the revenue that has happened, so the change in revenue in the current financial period compared to the previous. Uh, and by the way, what we're doing with here is we're looking, we're always comparing apples with apples. We're not comparing apples with pears. It's always apples with apples. So we're looking at the default position in currencies, looking at annualizing the current data, so if you're at the year end, you're comparing year end, current year end to the previous year end. If you're part way through the current financial year, you're, you're, we're analyzing that data within Clarity so that we can then compare that back to our previous year end as well. So we're always comparing apples with apples. Now, yes, for some businesses that are seasonal, some that potentially have big government contracts or long-term contracts that aren't accruing for them properly, potentially, or not doing the um, you know, the monthly adjustments with prepayments and the calls and so on. Yes, the annualization may not be the best way to look at it. So you do have the option to look at year to date. So excuse me, not year to date, rolling 12 months. So you have the opportunity to do that. So you can then see you know, for a seasonal business, um, if, if they sell, um, you know, snow boots, uh, looking at the business in, in, in July isn't going to be particularly good reading and annualizing from there. So if you want to compare July, you want to compare July to the previous year. So July this year to the previous year, July. So you can then see what's actually going on with that business. So you do have that opportunity as well. But just a reminder, no one actually looks at rolling 12 months uh, calculations. We always account for things on a, a month by month basis, on an annual basis. So um, that that opportunity to look at rolling 12 months calculations is they're purely just for those seasonal businesses, all those businesses that we said where they're not correctly reporting for long-term contracts. But uh, that's an opportunity for you guys to help them too in terms of bookkeeping and management reporting and getting them to do it, do it in, the, in the right way. So that's why annualized is the default because for most businesses that's enough. And we know that at least at one point in the year, at year end, hopefully, uh, because you're doing the year end accounts, that the figures are spot on. So we're always comparing back to that point. So that's how the numbers, effectively the overview of the numbers are calculated. So delving back into revenue growth. So we're looking at the change in revenue in the current financial year compared to the previous financial year. And that can be positive or negative. So if the revenue has gone down, obviously it would be a negative growth. And if it has gone up, then obviously the, the revenue growth is going to be a positive figure. And Ainsley was just putting his cursor on that negative 16.31%. You can see in the top left-hand corner of the tile. What that number does, and this is relevant for all of the seven key numbers, that shows the points difference. So the, the absolute difference in terms of revenue growth. So this business in the previous year actually had 21% revenue growth and we've dropped by 16 points. So we can see already starting to paint a picture 
but these are little clues, if you like. They're painting a picture in terms of what's going on with this business. So they've had revenue growth, which is great, of 5.39%. Actually, compared to the previous year, they had uh, 21 uh, percent revenue growth is actually so it's reduced so that gives us a clue and lead into the conversation with the client um, so that tells us what the number is and, and, and how it's calculated we've gone through that basis already as well um, so why is this number important well every business generally speaking they want to grow and one of the one of the main ways for checking that growth is looking at how they're growing on the top line um, and particularly if a business is going for investment, that's one of the key indicators that an investor will look at in terms of where, how is this business growing and how quickly is this business growing to make a decision on whether they fit the criteria for investment and then for how much. But it's not the be and on end all though. You know, there are other numbers and that's why we've got seven, not just one. Um, so we are looking at different areas, but this just gives a good indication of is the business growing in the right direction yes we can look at profit too obviously profit is very important as are the other seven key numbers that we have on the screen but revenue is a good revenue growth is a good indication of where things are going for the business now, at this Steve, point, Steve, sorry Steve and it's I think it's also important to mention here that if we're making to look, looking to make an impact on a business the biggest impact that that business can have for itself and the biggest growth and profitability will generally be driven from revenue growth now, there will be some businesses that potentially the business model is set up incorrectly and they grow broke. But for most businesses, the biggest difference they can make to their bottom line is by increasing their top line revenue growth number. And that's why a lot of organizations, a lot of entrepreneurial organizations, a lot of mentors and action coaches, they always focus on revenue growth. Um, we know as accountants that we need to have the right business model and it needs to be profitable growth. But revenue growth for a profitable business, for a scalable business, is absolutely the best way that they can make the biggest difference to the bottom line. Yeah, absolutely. As Andy mentioned, you want, you want to make sure that the bucket hasn't got any holes in it before you, before you fill it up with water. Uh, and that's what the other numbers allude to. Um, so you can always make that, bring that to the attention of the client too. Uh, but great point. Thank you very much, James. So what other points do you think, Steve, that you can bring from a discussion perspective from revenue growth? What flows from that, from the, from that, that number? Well, there's the certain things here in terms of discussions with the clients is you're always going to be looking at, um, so we always, the, the easiest way to, to increase revenue is to sell to your existing customers. Um, rather than it's, it's more expensive to go out and win new customers. So we, we know this, you have to pay for marketing. It takes time to do the marketing. It takes time for the clients, the new customers to come on board. So whilst somebody's already buying from you, they are more likely to buy from you again. So the opportunity there is, so how can you sell more to existing customers? So that is one of the quickest ways of actually improving the revenue growth. Um, so that, that's definitely one area to look at. Now, Pricing is another one as well. We, we can always look at improving things by 1%. Uh, I don't think, you know, if, if, I was, uh, if I was going down the pub and they in, increased the price by 1% on my uh, vodka tonic, I think I'd still buy it. I don't think that would deter me. And I think that's the case with any type of service or product. If the price goes up by 1%, that you're not going to have a drop off. But you can then certainly start playing with the numbers in terms of price increase and what impact that has on the bottom line and start having that discussion with the client as well. So is it 2%, is it 5%, is it 10%? So these are extra discussions with the client in terms of, so where can you draw the line? What sort of price increase do you think that you can introduce? And obviously you can work with your client to make these calculations and work out if there is, is an attrition rate, what would that be? Um, so that you can see that the, the exact figures on, on an impact on revenue and profit so remember, these numbers here are to start the conversation with your client to lead into extra work, which obviously you can charge for because it's hugely valuable and insightful for the client. Okay, so just to be clear here, Steve, Clarity is having the high level conversation around the main numbers and what changes in those numbers can do to the bottom line for the business and from a cash perspective. What we're looking to do here with Clarity is point to other discussions that we can have and other work that we can either do for the client or that they can do for themselves. So this is about us highlighting discussion points where we can help the client improve their business, where they can suggest 
and go away and do some work, or we can actually go away and help them do some of that work. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's good points to make. And just to re-emphasize, um, it's starting, we're starting the conversation with clarity. Absolutely. So we've talked about pricing. We've talked about selling more to existing customers. So the other areas really that you can focus on is around systemization in terms of you know, what, what's going on in the business. How do you actually make a sale? Um, what, what leads into your sales? So looking at your marketing system. So we've got two areas there that if you, if you have the capabilities within your team, uh, you can have those discussions with the client as well in terms of what, how does the marketing look? How long does it take for a lead to come through? How much does a lead cost? How long does it take for a sale to come through? What's your sales um, pipeline? How does that work? And how long, how long does it take for all of that to happen? So once you map that out, so that's one, one of the things that anybody can do within the team is just to listen to the client and map out what the sales process is and how long that, you know, T, T minus zero all the way through to when they get paid. And you can map that process out with the client and then you can look at the conversion rates along the way. Uh, in terms of how, you know, typically over the last months, 12 months, however it would be, how can you, um, how about the number, what's the, the number of conversion rates all the way through to getting paid? And then you can start to play with those numbers as well. And you can do the same with marketing too. So anyone within the team can help the client do that to recognize what's actually going on within the business. And then, so once they have that awareness, they then have the capability of looking at making those improvements. So again, coming back to the improvement by percentage points, how can we improve this by 1% each of these? How can we improve each of these by two or 3%? And then, so then you're adding extra um, revenue and extra profit, obviously, to the, the client there, just by looking at how they, how they go through that process and then looking at those improvements. Um, and the numbers will lead to non-numbers things potentially as well in terms of how does the client uh, have follow up with their customers, like, you know, how, how can they get a high conversion rate in certain areas. So it's bringing in the information to the client. And as we always say, this is very, very important to stress, you don't need to know the answers. The client always has the answers. They just need to be asked the right questions. And that's what Clarity enables you to do is you have the information, and then you can ask the questions. And as you know, within the action plan, we have prompts within there for the, the right types of questions to be asking the clients. So for your junior members of the team or for yourself, if you're stuck as well. Now, if you're a leader of the team, you may well know off the top of your head the three things that the client needs to work on and away you go. But we have that information in there to start the conversation. So it's up to us to ask the client the conversations and then to be able to create that extra value for the clients so they can then create that space to answer the question and tell you exactly what's going on and then create the action uh, action plan after that and absolutely you can then do these other things that we're talking about to be able to help them which obviously you would charge for you wouldn't do it for love um, you would you would do it your business you do it for money and that they will get results from it as well which is the whole point of being able to help them improve and grow their business the last thing, the last sorry. thing that you would do. Yeah. Sorry, Ains, come on. No, no, yeah, no, no. Nope. I was just going to say the last thing that you would do, um, but before you've exhausted all of those other things within the existing system uh, within revenue, is then look to go to adding new customers. Um, and again, as Ainsley mentioned, making sure that the business is profitable so that you don't grow broke, and not just the business itself, but its individual product lines or service lines. Making sure that you're doing departmental P and L analysis again some extra work some extra compliance work for you to charge for so that you can then clearly see what product lines what service lines within the business are profitable and if there are any loss making you consider whether they should still be there or if there's anything that can be done to improve them uh, and then making sure that the business is growing profitably and not growing broke and you add clients at the end so add new customers go out and get new customers after that so that would be the, the last step that you would do Great, Steve. And from a more strategic perspective, what, 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 what points should we be looking at here with revenue? Yeah, more strategically, we mentioned this a little bit already in terms of the sales and marketing pipeline. Just take, take stepping back and thinking about that in terms of how it all flows and integrates together. Now, the client may have separate departments for sales and marketing. And typically, from my experience, they don't talk to each other and play nicely. Um, so it's about bringing some... Um, 
cohesion together with those so they do the end goal is for the benefit of the business and it's not infighting between the sales and marketing team if they don't have separate teams that the people responsible for sales and marketing know exactly the joined up process that needs to happen so it's just stepping back and looking at that from from that systemization perspective and, and that pipeline um, which leads nicely on to looking at the business model as a whole and this is somewhere again where yourself or a leader within the accounting firm can help the client potentially they need to do some work on their business model maybe the maybe the business model isn't fit for purpose and it needs a review at least and you need to make sure that what they're doing is actually adequate um, that everything's joined up that it is profitable and moving forward you know we talked about departmental and uh, PL analysis that's one way of looking at that but just strategic stuff, stepping back and saying, well, how many of these do you need to sell each year to be profitable or each month? And what's the capacity of the team? What is actually possible? Is this a broken business model? So just doing some very back of a fag packet calculations, as I like to call it, um, just doing those high level reviews just to see if the business model is fit for purpose. So that, that's another area that we can look at. Um, that, there's a, a, a saying, um, looking at your ascending transaction model that we, we picked up from Daniel Priestley, which is a fantastic way of looking at how your different services or different products feed into each other so that you have a very low price or a free product or service, which then brings people into your pipeline, which then feeds into a, a, a low price service and um, that you can scale and give to the masses. And that leads into your, your main product or service your customers and then again that leads to a logical next step of a, a product or service for your customers so um, on a very high level looking at how all of your services and products or your clients services and products fit together and create that so that constantly you always have that driving up that someone's always on a journey and the journey always the next step is to go to the next service or the next product and keep them ticking along um, and the other thing we mentioned already as well is in pricing and that can come into play with the business model looking at what what does the pricing need to be um, and, and whether some a new package or a new service or a new product needs to be created to be able to deliver value so that you can create the type of price that you want and we've talked systems as well you know we talked about the systemization of the business so again looking at how everything works in the back end remember it's Businesses work because they have great systems. Yes, they have good people that use those systems, but it is always about the systems. We want to get the systems working properly. And if the people can't use the systems, we train them. And if they still can't use them, we can replace them and get the right people in. But generally speaking, if you recruit people, um, the right people to use the system that you have and fit, they fit your culture, well, that's a whole nother discussion, um, then, then your systems will do the work, not your people. They're there that's to deep. help you innovate and maintain. Yeah, and Steve, just, just to be clear, so when we talk about systems, we're saying how we do it here. That's how we do it here. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, it's how, how things work. If you want to get into the nitty gritty, it's the checklist, it's the procedure. It's you know, for whatever task that, that they're completing, there is a written down process for how that is completed. You know, there's standard templates for emails and scripts for telephone calls. There's a tick sheet for everything that needs to be done. So that's in the nitty gritty so that everybody knows. So the idea is that it, you can bring in anybody off the street um, and they would be able to, to get the same uh, output, the same outcome, because you have a repeatable system that gets the same results every single time. Yeah, and if our community members want to see an example of a system, then we will have shared systems with them. So it'll have had the, the why, the hot, the, the why, the how, the, the what. So it's you know, the purpose of the system, what we're trying to achieve and how we actually go about achieving it with scripts and with, with um, pro forma agendas and with tick boxes, as you say. So um, if you want a, an example of a system, then, then have a look at, at some of ours. Yep, absolutely. Right, can I just give a quick recap um, on, on that, Steve? So just to go back and talk about revenue growth and do a quick summary. So. Revenue growth obviously is the amount of revenue has increased or decreased in the period. We've talked about how that's calculated either on an annualized basis, comparing apples with apples, or whether we're looking at a rolling 12 month number depending on the, on the type of business. Um, and so from, from the default position, it's the difference between the annualized current year to date revenue to the previous year's revenue. And 
We know the previous year's revenue is accurate because that's the anchor point. So we're at least comparing the, the current period to, to an anchor point. Um, also, if we go forward, and my computer lets me go forward, um, <laughs> why it's important? Well, we've discussed that most growing businesses, revenue growth is, the, is, is probably the, the, the single, uh, single factor that's going to have the biggest difference to their, to their bottom line and potentially to their cash position as well, assuming that their uh, business model is sound and scalable and sustainable. And as we said, it's not the, the be it an, an end, although there are other uh, points that, that, that need to flow from it. And the initial discussion points that we talked about were about selling to existing customers and selling more to existing customers. And it's about increasing the transaction value and it's increasing the number of times you deal with existing customers. We often say that we're sitting on a mountain of gold and we don't realize it. And oftentimes the easiest way for us or for our clients to make more sales is to sell to existing customers because they trust us, they understand us, they know us. And so we should always look at how we can sell to existing customers before we go to the outside. And oftentimes we're quoted that it costs nine times, uh, it's nine times more expensive to sell to a new customer than it is to an existing customer. And that's because obviously the whole marketing machine that goes about uh, getting a new customer on board and actually selling to them, it, it obviously takes a lot, lot longer and it, and it costs a lot more. We've talked about pricing um, and this is a great way that we can have conversations with our clients because the natural response will be, I can't increase my prices, I'm going to lose all my customers. And so we can show them that if they do put a 5% price increase on, how many customers they'd have to lose before they were still at the same point. And so effectively they're doing better work, more higher value work for fewer customers. And so potentially that's an interesting discussion point in itself, freeing up resources and, and time for the team. But I think it's not just about price increase. It's about how we can increase the value to be able to justify a price increase. And I think that's the, that's the important point that we can discuss with our clients. And um, also systems, clearly we've discussed systems and, and getting new customers and um, acquiring and retaining those customers is, is really, really important. We also looked at the strategic points here and we looked at, um, we looked at the sales and marketing pipeline. And interestingly, when we talk about pipelines, uh, pipeline management is one of the areas that lots of people really struggle with. Um, at Clarity, we use Pipedrive. And I think Steve and I have used that previously in previous incarnations. And Pipedrive is a great way of uh, managing the pipeline and driving the pipeline forward. So if you want to have a look at Pipedrive for yourself, then that obviously would be a good suggestion. But again, I think you know, you should be looking to, to, to introduce your clients to tools that will actually help them and help their business. And, and Pipedrive is certainly one of those. Uh, from a, a business modeling perspective, you can look at the business model canvas um, if you want to look at developing and, and taking that further. And also bespoke financial modeling. But that's obviously clearly for those clients that really want to, to pay for that and are prepared to pay for a financial modeling session with you, which you know, can be anywhere from two and a half to, to 10,000 pounds, I suppose. Um, if you want to use technology and leverage technology to its fullest from a modeling perspective and from cash flow projections, then perhaps Futurely is, is one of the best and most efficient ways of, of generating a three-way forecast. So you can leverage that technology to, to really drive it forward. So thanks, Steve. Um, it's a, a good overview of the types of things that we need to discuss with the revenue. Shall we switch back on to the next number? Yes, please. Yeah, let's look at gross profit percentage. So as Ainsley said, we go. That's quick. Thank you, Ainsley. Um, so the next number, gross profit percentage. Again, not teaching you to suck eggs here, but we're, we know this is the, what this number is. So it's how profitable is the main activity of this business. So they're in business for a reason. What is that? You know, being able to deliver sales and deliver the end products, whether that's the product itself or whether that's the service. Those are the, you know, the cost of sales, as we know. That's what goes into there and the cost of delivery that uh, they tend to go into here so that we can then see what actually is the, the, the gross profit for the business. And this is calculated, as I alluded to, taking that profit figure uh, and dividing that by the, the revenue figure that's been generated. So that's, that's in terms of how the figure is calculated. If, if we follow the same format with regards to the, the, the same number of revenue growth that we're looking at, why is this important? Well, it makes sure that as, as a outset, it makes sure that the business can actually cover its costs. So what, we're then, what we can do here as well, which we'll come to in terms of introduction discussion points is some break even calculations with the client, because once we know what their overheads are, 
we can then use the gross profit to work backwards and then see how much they need to make in sales, whether that's uh, over the course of the year, broken down monthly, daily, whatever the case would be, we can then work out the, the break-even perspective and set targets for the client. Um, so we can at least see what's going on and uh, making sure that the business is making break-even um, and the required profit that they need to, to do. But more importantly, it's just showing whether, you know, as it says on its tin, it's just showing whether the business is making a profit. Is the business profitable and by how much? Obviously, you can compare this as well to other businesses in the same um, sector and same location to be able to see how the business is performing uh, in relation to its peers uh, and then what that does is gives us an indication in terms of so from benchmarking it doesn't tell us how but what it actually does is tell us what is possible so if we can see that our client is in um, the third quarter as an example uh, but and somebody else is way out ahead and has a ridiculous amount of, of gross profit we can actually take that to the client because I know that I've had clients say to me, I'm sure Ains has had the same, oh, that's not possible with my business. You know, my business is different. Um, as we know, your businesses are the same underneath. It's just the person that running them is different. So if we can expand their mind and show them what's possible, and that's what the great thing with benchmarking it does, it shows what is possible, then we can work out how to get to that afterwards and work together to do that. So, that's a general nutshell for gross profit. Ains, would you like to add anything there? Sorry, I I'm on mute. No, I think that's, that's a really good summary. I think it's also important potentially that we break down gross profit percentage by product or service line. I think if we think of the old 80-20 rules on gross profit, um, particularly with gross profit, potentially we're spending 80% of our effort and time on uh, products and service lines that are potentially only generating 20% contribution to our overheads. And interestingly, in exercises that we've done with clients in the past, where we've actually gone through their financial model, it's been really interesting to see that those areas that they thought were profitable actually didn't end up being profitable. Or for even those clients, it just reconfirmed what they thought was profitable was actually genuinely profitable. And I think one of the biggest things that we can do for our clients from a management reporting perspective or from a bookkeeping perspective is to break down gross profit by product and service line to make sure that what we know and understand is actually happening. And when we're looking at the costs of goods sold or the costs of services delivered, we we'll actually need to look at the entire costs that make that up. Because oftentimes we, for example, for ease might put all our salaries into into overheads and we may not actually bring the salaries relating to the cost of, of, of goods delivered or the cost of goods or services delivered or goods delivered we haven't actually taken the true costs above the line and i think this is a really really important area going forward and i think with the power of cloud accounting now and what we can do with with a data automation we should probably be spending more of the time now on areas that potentially in the past we had to just move forward to get the VAT return in. So working with the clients to actually identify their true gross profit by product and service line is probably one of the greatest things that we can do for them very simply and very quickly to actually give massive value and really aid the discussion going forward. Now, Clarity isn't going to do that for you. You are going to need to do that outside. But what hopefully Clarity will show is that and make it clear <laughs> that this is an area that needs work and it's an area that we as a firm of accountants can work with you to actually drill down and to get better data to be able to make better decisions. Yeah, thank you, Ainsley. And, and, and the case in point, the demo data that we have on screen has been created to show just that. Because if you look at the gross profit figure there, you know, that's, uh, that's not realistic. Uh, anyone, e even service office providers don't make that type of uh, gross profit percentage. So, you know, at this point in time, you have the opportunity. So, you know, one of the questions that you can ask in terms of discussions is, or, or the point that you can make is that figure looks quite high. Um, do you ask a client, do you feel it's correct? And you can then offer financial health check or whatever it is that you would like to call it to be able to check that the chart of accounts have been set up correctly. And that, um, correct monthly adjustments are being incorporated so that you don't get gross profit that's up and down all of the time that you do get it fairly straight line every single month um, so that you can then make better decisions based on that information so and that's one of the ways of intro the introductory conversation with the client is in terms of going back to what Ainsley was saying with the services and, and the product lines 
um, is, is which ones which ones are, are adding to the the profit and which ones are not do you need to get rid of any customers potentially um, what customers are taking up too much time and effort that's something to have a think about with the client and that type of an analysis would be able to draw that conclusion as well because as, as Ainsley mentioned the client might have something in mind but actually when you look at the hard facts you look at the numbers it's something completely different so it's always good to back up what's going on with the client's thoughts as well as what's actually going on within the business um, you know we, we all know the story that the client says we I kind of made that much profit because where's the cash um, so we always do need to quantify um, the figures that are going on. Some other things as well that we can look at. So we talked about which customers are taking much too much time and effort uh, and potentially we can look at either sacking them or moving them on to somebody else because one person is rubbish, not the calling people or clients, customers rubbish, but you get the analogy is another person's treasure. So um, there is that opportunity there to do something with it as well and to look after them still if that's what you want to do. But then the flip side of that is, well, what can you do to meet more of your customers' needs? So what can you do to meet more of your customers' needs? Um, and this is focused more on, as Ainsley said, delivering more value. So if you can deliver more value, if you can solve more of their problems, ultimately that's all business is really, is that we're providing a solution to a problem and getting paid for it. So what other problems can we solve or what problem, the existing problem that we're solving or the client is solving, what can they do to solve it better or quicker um, or more effectively? So look at how to make that more profitable. Um, so that's a, some initial conversations that you can have with the client. In addition, we've talked about systemization. There will be overlap uh, as we go through um, the, these, all of these numbers. They do overlap with each other and so do some of the conversation points and strategic points that we're going to look at. Let's look at systemization, or better yet, let's look at technology. What technology are we using? Ainsley's already mentioned about pipe drive with regards to revenue growth, the clients or prospective clients that fall through the gap because they're not being followed up properly. It's one of the, the biggest losses within a sales pipeline. Um, what other technology could we use to help from a gross profit perspective to make things more efficient? Um, to make to make the business more profitable can we leverage technology remember technology is there to do the heavy lifting you still need people you still need process so that all, all of those things work together those three things work together in harmony to be able to produce a better end result so it's, all, it's always about bringing that together and helping us helping our, our people use the right systems and improve and innovate with the systems in the same with the technology and then something that's particularly relevant for our profession uh, in terms of accounting, but also relevant for other businesses too, is, is looking at fixed price agreements. Because once we know, once we know that we've got, um, this, and this is looking at sales as well as costs. So once we know that we've got a particular amount of costs to cover, we, then we know exactly where our, our margins, our gross profit is going to be. And the same we can do with the, our revenue. So if, if we have fixed price agreements, we know that we've got a agreement for a set amount of time we know what the income is going to be. So it helps us make better decisions moving forward with the client. So that, those are just a few areas in terms of how to introduce this discussion point with the client. Uh, Ainsley, is there anything else that you would like to add? No, Stevie, I think that's a, that's a good summary of the types of things we can talk about in gross profit. I think it's just worth hammering home the point about the, the deliverables about what we can do here. Just like in revenue growth, where it's really, really important that we help the client with budgets and through a forecasting and understanding their financial model so that we can measure going forward where they are on track with, with revenue. It's also the same with, with gross profit. So I think that's a really important point for us to discuss here is, is getting proper uh, uh, three-way forecasting and plans in place and also about better bookkeeping and better management reporting so that we can actually put in the right information, the right adjustments on a regular basis. And, and, and that departmental analysis, I think, is really, really critical. I think from a strategic perspective, the points that we can discuss here particularly much are about break-even points. So we can potentially discuss with a client and that's a really good discussion point to have as to where, what is break-even. So what, what do we need to sell to actually break even to, to keep the doors open? Um, and I think that's a good strategic point to discuss um, at that perspective. And as we said, there's a lot of overlap because I think efficiencies come into play here. So team, team and systems and product efficiency and usage efficiency becomes really, really critical in gross profit percentage. But again, we'll see that 
that flow through to revenue per employee again. And I think um, looking just at the whole cost control area, which we'll be discussing from an EBITDA and operating profit percentage, percentage cost control is really, really critical. I think it's been clear here, Steve, that systemization has been a, a recurring theme. And again, to hammer home the point on systemization, systemization is um, why we do what we're doing here. Um, so this is how we do it here. This is how we do what here. This is how we do everything here. So systemization is, is critical to, to, to going forward with the business. Great. So if I can just give a quick summary, Steve, I'm just going to have to, um, I think my uh, slide deck is not playing ball, um, unfortunately. So I'm just going to have to just bear with me for two seconds while I switch over screens and tech always leads you down, doesn't it? It's just a bit <laughs> It's great when it works. Great when it works. Um, so when we go forward to gross profit percentage, just a quick summary and a quick overview again. So obviously it's how profitable the main business activities of the business are. And we've talked about breaking that down by product or, or service line. It's really, really critical. And it's the profit from delivering those as a percentage um, to revenue generated. And it's important that we get all the costs in here. This isn't just about uh, simple maths for us or simple bookkeeping. It's about properly doing the job and being able to use automation to enable us to actually focus on the right areas to work with for the client. So why it's important, it's making sure that the business can at least break even and produce the required profit. We discussed the introductory points that you can have with the clients on discussion points. And we discussed the importance of, of knowing which service lines and which product lines are, are, are generating a contribution towards overheads. And again, the more strategic points to look at are break even, looking at efficiency systems and cost control. So uh, a, a good range of things to talk about from to the client on gross profit percentage. And again, can I just say that it's important that we start the conversation with the client. The more used to getting to uh, that, that you are in speaking about these numbers, the more confident you will be at, at discussing all aspects of these numbers. But it's important just to get started. And you know, clients will not have had this type of conversation in the past. So don't panic about having to know everything. Get started and start the discussion because really the client, as Steve said, knows a lot of these answers. They just need prompting and they just need us to, to focus them in the right areas um, and, and, and hopefully hold them accountable going forward. And the assumption that we make, uh, I think, as well, in, in, incorrectly, and I, I hold my hand up, I've done this in the past with clients, is assuming that they know what I know with regards to numbers, and a lot of them don't. I would say, you know, probably 99% of business owners don't, otherwise they would have gone into business to be an accountant or bookkeeper. Um, so you can tell them the basic stuff, the stuff that comes easy for you to explain, you know, just explaining what gross profit percentage is, as an example. Um, you know, that type of thing is still valuable to the client. So to do bear that in mind as well as a starting point with, uh, with speaking to the client. Cool. Okay, let's move on to the third number. So here we've got operating profit percentage or also known as EBITDA. We know what EBITDA is. It's earning just before interest, taxation, depreciation and amortization. We may need to explain that to the client. The reason we've introduced that phraseology and um, the acronym there is because that's what investors um, look, like, look at when they're looking at valuing a business and in, investing and buying businesses. Ultimately, for some of your businesses, some of your clients, they will go through to sale or they will go through to raising money and investment. So we're getting them familiar here with them by showing them this screen, we're getting them familiar with that. And again, it just gives an opportunity for you to demonstrate your expertise. You're explaining something to them that in the business world, this is a common phrase. They now know it. So they, they feel a little bit more enlightened about it as well. Um, in, its, in its purest sense, it's, it's how profitable the, the, the business is as a whole. That's as simple as it is. In terms of what the calculation actually is and how it's calculated, is we're taking the net profit, excluding interest tax, depreciation, and amortization, and comparing that as a percentage to the revenue generated. And again, in terms of the figure itself, and you know, we're talking about gross profit, in isolation, it doesn't mean anything, really, unless you have something to compare it against. So that's why, as you know, within Clarity, what we're always doing is this, these seven key numbers are always the stick in the sand to start with. Uh, and then you're going to compare that to, to where the, percent, the business potentially could get to. Similarly, with benchmarking, you're comparing to where the business is compared to its peers, or you're comparing a past performance to where the business is now. And that's those little numbers at the top left-hand corner indicate that whether the business has improved um, or hasn't 
you know, it's gone backwards in relation to the previous financial year. But you have the opportunity to go back further and do five years worth of analysis if you want to. Um, you've got that, you've got the data if the client has the information. Um, so you have that ability to as well. So remember, this is the stick in the sand to start. So it looks like a dashboard, definitely not a dashboard. We're talking about the numbers in isolation here. So just to remind you, this is the stick in the sand, like GPS in cars, you know, again, sat nav, we're pinging the location of where we are now, because once we know that, and then once we calculate where we want to get to, we can then create the path, because we need both points, the A and the B point, to be able to do that. So that's what we're doing here within Clarity. So we talked about um, how it's calculated, um, and, make, and what, what that actually means, um, what the actual number is, why is it important? Well, just again, coming back to gross profit, in a nutshell, it's making sure that the business is profitable, because ultimately, Businesses are in, as we talked about, we're, we're solving problems for certain people uh, and we get paid to do that, but it's making sure that we do that profitably so that we can cover at least all of our costs. And then uh, typically you know, what we do in the UK is pay dividends um, to the business owners so that they can then pay themselves some extra remuneration. Or if they have external business owners like big PLCs, they want to pay back to their shareholders for investing with them as well so that we can then give something back and then profit is reinvested into the business to do new things, to continue um, doing what they're doing, et cetera, as well. So that's, that's why it's important to make sure um, that we're tracking that number. Introduction yeah, think, sorry, Steve, yeah. to add, sorry, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to say that potentially you might be asked by the client, why are we looking at operating profit and why are we not looking at net profit? Yeah. Well. The reason we're discounting interest tax depreciation and amortization is that we're trying to compare businesses on a like for like playing field. Some businesses will have a significant investment in capital, um, so their depreciation might be high. Some businesses might have um, acquired another business and therefore they've got some goodwill that they're writing off, so they're amortizing that goodwill. Or we might have, particularly this business might have a lot of borrowings. It might not be normal for a business of this in this ilk to have that level of borrowings. So we're trying to eliminate the, the potential um, spiky points um, and, and compare most businesses on a like for like. And this is an area that banking particularly looks for as well, because they want to make sure that the business is generating an operating profit to cover its interest uh, payments. And so you've heard the term interest cover. So operating profit is important from that perspective, and that's why we're looking at it rather than net profit, particularly in, in this scenario. Thank you, Ace. So some introductory discussion points around this will be, well, it's, it's cost control effectively. So all the things that we talked about within, within gross profit, so some of those points are relevant here as well, but more importantly, it's about what costs can we reduce, what costs can we remove altogether, how can we use cash, to actually get a discount, we know with um, some suppliers that if we pay them up front, that they will give us a discount. So that will re uh, reduce the cost overall. So we're leveraging cash if there is cash to be used in the first place, obviously. And you may want to do a cash flow forecast for clients to make sure that that is the case. Um, can you negotiate lower pricing with existing customers? Can you switch, sorry, suppliers? Can you uh, switch suppliers? Um, it's looking at these other things. So what the client, what can the client do within their business to reduce their costs and leverage cash more profitably? So that, those, are, those are the main points really in terms of introduction of discussion points. And again, coming back to the deliverables like Ainsley mentioned previously, it's looking at, looking at budgets, looking at budgets and actually using them and sticking with them, looking at KPI dashboards, looking at three-way cash flow forecasting. Is being able to do that with the client and sit down with them each month and the success i know that ainsley tells a fantastic story about the success that he's had with, with some of his clients just by holding them accountable to a budget that you know ideally you'd sit down and do the work with the client to do a proper budget but just even just adding five percent to the figures and i've had a similar experience with clients in my firm doing the same thing just holding them accountable to the targets that they've set within their budget it's surprising how powerful that actually is and how profitable the business becomes quite quickly as you address the problems that come up um, as, as you go forward. Uh, Ains, is there anything else you'd like to discuss in terms of introduction and, and deliverables regarding? I think the biggest point I can add here, Steve, is the fact that there was a study done in the US at California University which showed that 
uh, business owners that were held accountable achieved 78% more. And that was just on any tasks that they had just by being held accountable, they achieved 78% more. Can you imagine if they had the right tasks at the, at the start? So how much more could they achieve? Well, clearly they'll achieve 78% more, but it's more of, of a better starting point. So um, I think the, the action plans and, and an accountability and having proper uh, plans in place, having proper bookkeeping in place and having proper management reporting I think that's that's something that we as 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 accountants can give to the to small business owners, and it's the greatest thing uh, that we can do, quite simply, to actually generate and drive their profitability. Absolutely, it's a skill that we already have. We don't need to train. We don't need to to do anything for it. We have those already delivered within our team. Absolutely. So, what are the more strategic points, Steve, that we should look at from from an EBITDA operating profit? Clearly, this is an area that accountants know well. This is a number that we really, really understand, uh, and it's probably the number that most clients will go to on, on, on a P and L or in a set of accounts. If we give them accounts, they'll probably go for net profit, but you know, profitability we certainly get. So, what are the more strategic areas that we can look at here? So, it, come, it comes back to some of the ones we've covered already. Now, systemization again. This is a reminder: how do we do things here? Looking at that again making sure that things are flowing properly because uh, we, we want the end result. We, we always want to have that bigger and the right level of profit. So things have to work properly and flow to the bottom of the business. So again, systems here, looking at break even point as part of, as you know, as part of the calculation with break even point is taking the overheads. Um, so we need to look at that. Are we using the right overhead figure? What can we do to reduce those costs? Cash flow management, having a look there. Cost control we've already talked about. Uh, and then again, coming back to what Ains was saying previously with regards to how the individual departments, if you like, fit back to each other. So yes, there may well be some service lines or product lines that are more profitable than others. 80-20, as Ains mentioned, tends to be the case. So you, uh, you may have some loss-making lines, but may, there may be, or your client will, but there may be required uh, to be able to help. Uh, the business move forward. So it's looking at that and bringing it all together and looking at as a whole, um, as, as well as in isolation. So those are the more strategic areas in terms of where to look. Okay, Stevie, so just as a brief uh, summary, it's uh, basically uh, uh, understanding how profitable the operation of the business uh, as, a, as a whole. It's net profit excluding interest tax depreciation and amortization compared as a percentage to the, number, to, to the revenue generated. And we've discussed why we're excluding interest tax depreciation and amortization and why banks particularly and investors and funders look to exclude those numbers. Particularly, uh, you might uh, say to a client that if somebody else is taking over the business, they may have a different uh, method of, of financing. And so the interest figure particularly might be different in, in their scenario, or they may be combining and, and taking advantage of synergistic benefits. And so therefore depreciation and amortizing, amortization may not be particularly appropriate to, to, the, to, the, to the acquiring business. So it's a, it's a really key important area that we get clients into. Um, and obviously it shows is the business profitable and is it actually generating and, and, and is it capable of generating cash because operating cash obviously is one of the most important elements of, of running a business, generating cash from operations. So the introductory discussion points as we discussed were primarily around uh, particularly uh, cost reduction and getting rid of wasteful costs. This isn't about getting rid of costs as a whole because we know if we cut costs, we end up potentially with an inferior product. And it's often the temptation for, for the accounting industry to eliminate costs at all costs. <laughs> but we know that that potentially isn't right. What we're doing here is getting rid of wasteful costs or, or helping the client understand what's wasteful. And as a business ticks along on an ongoing basis, it just accumulates costs. And so sometimes doing a cost audit once a year, or maybe even um, more frequent than that, is really, really helpful because any cost that we're incurring should be generating revenue or generating um, uh, you know, contributing to, to, the, to the products or contributing to the value that's being created. And so getting rid of wasteful costs is probably the primary discussion point that we would have with a client around this area. And again, as you said, because this is the bottom line, this is effectively where everything flows to. So we should be looking at overheads. We should be looking at our cash flow management. We should be looking at the business model and does it actually make sense? And we should be looking at systems within the organization. So again, you can see how these numbers intertwine clearly um, one results from the others. So it's important that if you see common points being discussed, don't worry about it. It's helpful to repeat to a client. It's helpful for them to, to gain um, 
a, a deeper understanding of those numbers. Okay, Stevie, so if we move on to the next number. Yes, please. So revenue per employee. This is one of my favorite numbers. We talked about before that all of these numbers look holistically at the business. Now, this particular number itself, revenue per employee, looks holistically uh, in itself. And you'll see in a moment why. So how is it calculated? Well, it's taking revenue and dividing it by the full-time equivalent uh, numbers or some kind of employee numbers in your business to give you an idea of how the team are contributing towards revenue. Um, and, and that's effectively what, that's what it is and, and how it's calculated. So it's, it's a t effectively, in its, in its purest sense, it's a team efficiency calculation. Um, that there are opportunities here for more um, technology-driven or IP-based companies to be able to talk about um, the, the intellectual property return that they're getting. But you know, we, can, we can park out for now. Um, in its purest sense, it's just how well is the team getting on at delivering revenue for the business. Now the benchmark to this will change. Um, so depending on, you know, I don't think there is a rule of thumb type for every type of business. Generally speaking for service businesses, I think you have to break it into the different categories. So generally speaking for service businesses, anything over 125K is a good number, absolutely. Now if you're um, a manufacturer, that would be very different. If you're a farmer, again, it would be very different. Um, and we've seen that through with, with clarity already that the, the numbers are very high. Uh, for revenue per employee um, for, for rural businesses. So in, you know, it, it, no one number fits all, but again, what we're doing with Clarity is we're just sticking the sand. We're saying, right, this is where you are now. How can we improve it? Um, so that, that's always a point to remember. And we can look at benchmarking as well separately. To, so you're comparing like for like for sector uh, and location. So, but as I mentioned, it gives a holistic view. So what do I mean by that? Well, if you think about it, it's looking at revenue and, and employees. And if we dr drill deeper into those, we're looking at all of those elements that we've discussed before in terms of um, the sales pipeline, the marketing, the systems, the pricing, our customers, and so on. So we've got all of that area. And then from an employee's perspective, we're looking at team, we're looking at culture, uh, we're looking at values. We're also looking at systems again in terms of operations and how the, the, the team operate. So it's very much a case of not just looking at one particular area of the business. It's looking pretty much holistically in terms of where you can delve deeper into with regards to this number. So introductory discussions around this, certainly you can start from uh, the productivity gap. Um, what, what you can determine from that is in terms of what is the potential revenue that you can generate from your existing team. So what if, let's say for argument's sake, they have 80% of their time is, so this is for a service business, this is a fantastic number to calculate. Uh, it's different for manufacturing, obviously, because, and, and uh, other types of business, because you would calculate this based on machinery or equipment, or whatever the case would be. But for team, uh, for service businesses, you could say, well, let's say that they're chargeable, they're productive 80% of the time. What would be the revenue um, that we could generate? You know, it's quite easy for us to calculate as accountants as well. So what would be the revenue? And then we can then compare that potential revenue to what actually is happening. What, what is the actual revenue? And we could, so we could very easily calculate that with the client and then compare the two. And then very often, as the case in my experience, the gap has been huge. Um, uh, so then it's uh, you know, a draw dropping moment for the client for them to see that change. And so it gives us an idea in terms of, okay, so how do we get closer to that? How do we get closer to that? And again, that's where we can look at those other areas I just mentioned um, in terms of looking at the sales, looking at the marketing, looking at the systems, how do we do things? What, what about the people, what about the culture, what about the team? So those lots of things there that we can dig our teeth into as accountants to help move forward. Um, other areas as well that we can look at in terms of, well, if, if we've got a particular um, profit in mind, so bringing all of the numbers together, so if we've got a particular net profit figure in mind that we wanna to get to, because that's our target for the year, we've created the budget, how do, we, how do we get beyond that? How do we grow beyond that? So what you can do is incentivize the team to work harder, to do more, um, with the output over and above what was set. So you could potentially share with them what the budget is, not necessarily all of the numbers, but in terms of what their output is, what's required of them. So that's their baseline and anything over and above that, they, they will share in the extra spoils that the company gets. So that's something else that you can do there. 
Um, so we talked about productivity gap. We've talked about sharing, incentivizing the team. So other areas as well to look at is that delegation is making sure that the right people are doing the right things. So again, this can come back to the sales team. If we just think about the sales team for the moment, their job purely is to make sales. So they get leads from the marketing team. And you know, I'm, I'm saying team, um, it might be two different people. It might be the same person wearing a different hat, but let's just say team for the moment. So they get a lead from the marketing team. They then have to close that sale as the sales team member uh, and, and to make that, um, that prospect become a customer. And um, once, once that happens, then obviously the rest of the business then has to deliver. But what if all that salesperson did was sell? Because that's what you want them to do. You want them to do is just sell, be on the phones, be on emails, be in meetings, whatever the case would be, just making, closing the sale, however that is done. But you don't want them doing paperwork or, or even booking appointments on email, that type of thing. You don't want them booking calls. Ideally, they will have an admin support to help them do that. And this is where delegation can come in. I'm just using sales as an example. This happens in, in every area. The, the, the individual, the role, whatever it is that their, their desired output, their desired goal, that's what they should be focusing on. So how can, how can the business that's a question to ask, how can the business delegate, delegate more of the non-required tasks to somebody else to free up their time to then be able to deliver what they're supposed to be doing? And I said, the sales one is a great example because then if the salesperson doesn't have to do all of that admin, doesn't have to book those calls, doesn't have to respond to emails, doesn't, doesn't have to nurture people through the system. Um, they, if all they're doing is turning up for, for meetings and selling then the job's done um, that's exactly what you want them to do um, similarly here we're looking at, uh, at systems so again how can operating systems be improved what can what can we do to make things slicker what can we do to leverage technology again bringing back some of the other questions that we've had in the other areas you can see how these numbers work on each other and how holistic this one is in particular as well I think that's probably enough in terms of introductory points there, Ains. Is there anything else that you'd like to add? No, I think it's just, just important to summarize, Steve, that, that this number feeds really uh, probably four main discussion points. It's not just about staffing levels within an organization, although those are important, and it's important to understand whether the team we have is appropriate for the revenue we're generating. What this number also can lead to discussions is on the efficiency of that team. So how efficient are they? It can also, and whether they're operating to their, to their maximum, it's also how efficient the systems and processes were within the organization, and it's how efficient we use technology. So it's those four discussion points that, 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 that really flow from this number, and it's all the things that are related to those four elements. And again, you know, we looked at, at a target of 125. That's kind of pretty much an efficient, tech-efficient business that is using technology, using systems, and using uh, processes and team efficiency to its fullest. And it's generating between 125 and, and 150 is probably um, where you're probably going to max out with, with a lot of organizations that we're used to dealing with, and particularly small businesses. It's the tech giants like Google and Amazon and whatever that will generate probably a million uh, revenue per employee. Um, but it's important that from a small business perspective, we're looking at maybe 125 to 150 is a really efficient, effective business making use of technology to its fullest. It might be that that business can't use technology. It might be uh, like a restaurant, for example, where yes, they can bring technology to play, but actually the bulk of the, the, the cost of, is gonna be in, the, in the, the, the cost of preparing the food with the team salaries, the actual cost of the, 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 the produce, and also the restaurant team for serving and waiting and doing all of that. So potentially they will not achieve that revenue. So yes, we do need to be cognizant of the industry they're in. And it's, it's a number that we have a starting point with the client as a discussion point, And it's a number that we just need to drive up. And in its simplest form, that's what we're looking to do to get more revenue per employee. And this isn't about um, cracking the whip here. This is about actually helping the client understand what's important from an efficiency and from a team perspective and what's possible within the business both from systems, processes, and, and tech. Cool. Thank you, Anis. Um, um, we pretty much covered the strategic points as well. You know, we've talked about team capacity, efficiency, culture, um, systems again, and, and training and education as well within the team, getting the right people into the organization as well. Okay, so just as a brief summary, we've gone through those main points. 
And again, from a strategic perspective, we're looking at team capacity and efficiency culture. Um, and I think, you know, culture exists in your organization, in any organization culture exists. It's important that the, the leaders of the organization control what sort of culture exists in your organization. So we need to create a culture of continuous improvement. We need to create a culture of learning. We need to create a culture of change. We need to create a culture of acceptance. Um, all those areas we really need to focus on. And it's important for us as, a, as business uh, advisors to be telling our clients that if they're not sick of talking about their values and their culture and driving that in their organization, then they're probably doing, uh, not doing a good enough job. It's about training and education as well, clearly. It's not just about cracking the whip, as I said. It's about having the right products and services too, because we looked at gross profit. And oftentimes, if we're all rowing in the wrong direction, it doesn't matter how fast we row, we're still going in the wrong direction. Um, so we do need the right products and service mix so that we all know that we're actually working for, for the right areas. And again, it all comes down to systemization, systems, systems, systems. Systems are what's critical to creating a small business. We need to effectively create a business in a box for our clients. They need to create a McDonald's. Uh, uh, Ray Kroc brought in systemization in there and that's what they need to be doing and it's not about creating a robotic enterprise if that's the objection that comes back from you it's not about being a robot it's about systemizing the 85 percent and allowing the 15 percent humanity to take uh, to kick in this is about creating repeatable uh, results it's about everybody understanding why that why they're doing what they're doing and to create a consistent uh, feel and look and um, I suppose results for, for, for both the organization and for the customers and clients that you're dealing with. So systemization is critical. Okay, Stevie, we'll go on to core cash target. Core cash target. So here what we're doing is, th this is a number that's, that's looking at the ideal cash, the target of cash in hand um, that the business should have without any funding um, to be in control of their own destiny effectively. Uh, or what you might call a, a resilient balance sheet. So this is to, to have um, the taxes that are due. So this is how this number is calculated. So the tax is due. So for the UK, that's you know, corporation tax or income tax, plus your VAT, plus any PAYE tax, payroll tax as well. So what we're doing is taking that taxes due figure and adding two months worth of overheads. And to, by doing that, as we mentioned, the idea is to get to a resilient balance sheet. So um, you know, we, we'll look at cash days, um, our interpretation of working capital days in a moment. So we'll look at that separately. But this is to say, right, we have a reserve. If something goes wrong, we're okay. You've probably seen, you've probably heard us speak about the, um, the, the low success rates or the high failure rates, whichever way you want to look at, a bit, look at it, of small businesses. If we can actually help them, if we can prop up their balance sheet a little bit, if we can add some, um, some cash to their, their bank, that they will then be more resilient uh, and they will be able to ride things out when things aren't going as well for them. And in addition to that, so what this target is, so the core cash target, as you can see on the screen, so we've got the 113K, that's the, the core cash target. That's where we want the business to be before it makes any other decisions in terms of starting new projects, uh, hiring new people, plowing more money into marketing, um, you know, paying more money to shareholders, that type of thing. Uh, that, this is the figure that the balance in the bank should actually be. And as you can see on the screen, we have the actual cash balance on this tile as well. And you can see that that's 80K. So we're some 33K short in terms of where the business should be. So immediately we have a, a conversation potentially about a funding gap. Do we have a funding gap in this business? So it's something, it's a, a question that you can, again, we talked about the clues. Uh, this is a, a clue to have a conversation with the client about. So do we have a funding gap? Do we have a funding problem? Do we need to be having a cash flow statement to see what's going on within this business? And what types of funding do we need to be looking at as well, which we'll get to in a moment. But initially, straight off the bat, we can see of what actually um, is, is required for this business for it to have a resilient balance sheet and for it to be able to have that buffer there to be able to pay things as the business goes along. Um, so that emphasizes why it's in your, how it's calculated, what it is and, and why it's important. So it's a clear target that we need to get to. And anything over and above that figure, obviously, yeah, that can be used for new projects, new team members, marketing, extra dividends, whatever the case may be. Um, so that gives us that, that standpoint, that stick in the sand again to know what's going on there. Now, 
Call cash target. When we think of cash, the most instant thing that we think about is getting cash in from customers um, or clients in our case as accountants, but for our clients, for their, their customers or clients, however they describe them. So that could be in terms of um, you know, getting paid earlier. How can they get paid earlier? How can they get paid quicker? Can they, are they possible, is it possible to get paid in stages? Can they get paid in advance? So that's the most logical place that we go to. It's not the be all and end all though. We also need to look at the whole, the cyclical nature, the whole business to see where is cash being used. So yes, we can do debt chasing. Yes, we can get direct debit set up. Yes, we can do those things. We'll certainly ask the client those questions as well. But how quickly is the client invoicing? Let's, let's take a step back. Think about an accounting firm you know, with work in progress. How quickly are we raising the invoice after the work is completed? Now, typically in an accounting firm, or from, from my experience at least, uh, what I've seen uh, is at least 30 days because of the cyclical nature of how the invoicing is done. So what, what if we could invoice in advance instead so we get, and we have negative whip? Is that possible? You know, those are the types of questions you can be asking yourself as your own firm uh, if that's a consideration for you. So we're talking about raising invoices quicker so to avoid work in progress or to get that as low as possible. So we've looked at the whip, but what about businesses that have stock or inventory? Um, what, what can we do there? So can, can we change the stock methodology? Can we operate a just in time methodology there? How, what products are sitting on the stock on the shelves? Um, you know, it's pound notes uh, or dollars, whatever, you know, whichever currency that you use, it's actually sat on the shelves. What can we do about that? How can we get rid of it? How can we bring cash in? And how can we just make sure we have that just in time methodology? Um, look again, coming back to the things we've talked about before, what products, what services are profitable? Which ones are the most profitable? Which ones should we be that focused on and which ones should we potentially be thinking about leaving? And then obviously as well, the end of the cash cycle, if you want to call it the end, um, is, is looking at paying your suppliers. So are we leveraging credit terms that we already have? Is the client leveraging their supplier days that they have available to them. So if they get terms, 30 day terms from their suppliers, are they using all 30 days? Yes, we don't want to pay people late because we don't want to be paid late. So let's pay within the rules. But if you've been given terms, use them and make sure that you're, you're, you're making the benefit of that cash flow cycle. So again, you can see how this impacts on, on working capital days, but cash doesn't just mean getting money in, in terms of customers. It looks, it looks at the whole area. Uh, so there's a, those are certainly discussion points that you can look at there. In addition to um, you know, getting rid of some costs, again, looking at cost control, we've talked about that um, earlier already as well. One of the biggest things that I've seen in my career, though, as an accountant, is the owner, the business owner or owners, paying themselves more potentially than they should be. Um, so that's a question there, which is obviously a very... Um, Personal question, but for the sake of the business, depending on how far away the funding gap potentially is, can the business owner or owners be paid later or can they receive less for a short period of time just to help build up that cash reserve? So that's something else to have a look at there. And then ultimately, what access to funding and investment do they actually have? Ains, was there anything else that you'd like to... No, I, I think that's that's really comprehensive. I think in, in, in just to summarize the core cash target, we'll, we'll go on to cash days and cash acceleration strategy um, when we discuss cash days. And, and these two numbers are inextricably linked as, as all the numbers are linked. Um, but these particular two numbers are, are, are quite close together, cash and, and core cash target. I think the main discussion points that we want to be talking to a client here is how, as an organization, can we accelerate cash and can we generate cash within the existing business from our own operations to add to our cash stockpile? Or how can we get cash from external sources? And then, as you said, that leads to the funding questions. How can we get access to the right cash at the right price? And how can we make sure that we're using that cash for the best way possible within our business? And so funding gap, funding plans, working with clients to truly understand their funding is a, is, is a great way for us to add value. Too many of our clients in the past have had access to uh, cheap finance from um, the, um, the funding circle or similar organizations. And oftentimes they've come to us and said, oh, I've got a loan. Um, and oftentimes it's gone to plug a working capital gap and it's actually not been used to generate 
a better business that's creating a better return to be able to fund not only the interest payments but the capital repayments and the clients are just getting themselves into trouble so it's important that we take that proactive stance on funding that we're there and, and highlighting to the client that potentially there's a, a cash gap here now we are looking at stats and this is down to a particular moment and snapshot in time. There might be reasons why cash is going to suddenly come into the business in the next three to four weeks. So it's not just about saying, oh my God, you've got a funding gap, we need to get some money in. This is about us starting to alert the clients to why funding is important, why core cash target and a resilient balance sheet is so important and how they need to be working towards that target. And it might be that the business will naturally get to that target or it might be that the, uh, the business does need funding or it might be that when we work for the future screen and we work at playing with the business and seeing what's possible within the business but the the, the changes and the growth we want to make uh, and want to put in play might create a natural funding gap where we need funding to enable that to happen so i think core cash target that's that's, that's a critical summary is that it's how can we generate cash within the business and do we need to go to external sources to actually help uh, with that position Absolutely. And, and, uh, and the, the main deliverable that we can deliver there as accountants is the cash flow forecast. As Ainsby said, if there may be some, there may be a cash influx in the next month after this particular date. Um, so, you know, we need to take that into account and actually what's going on within the business to see whether there is a funding requirement at all. Um, okay. I think we've covered the strategic points there as well, Ains, uh, in, in terms of... Oh, we've got you on mute. Sorry, Ains. Just, let's just do a quick summary there as we've got it. So it's the ideal cash target to have on hand without debt funding to be in control, to be in control of the future of the business and to have that resilient balance sheet. And as we said, it's, it's the taxes payable plus two months of overheads set aside. Um, we looked at why it's important because clearly see any surplus available for new projects, new teams and distributions. Um, as we said, small business owners tend to hoof all the cash out of the business and we need to try and temper that, 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 um, uh, that, that, that action um, but it also clearly it shows the surplus but it shows the deficit too and whether we need to get help with that and the points we discussed was about costs it's about how we can uh, delay payments of certain cash how we can get paid quicker those are short-term solutions what we need to make sure is the business model actually supports the creation on a normal and natural basis uh, for, for, the, for this uh, um, core cash target it's yes we can do things quickly to make it better but it's about creating a resilient balance sheet a long-term balance sheet and a long-term plan and so we may need help from out the outside to enable that to happen and as Steve said the discussion and strategic areas that we're looking at are working with the client to create a funding plan is is probably and doing that on a proactive basis is probably really really important we need to be looking at cost controls we need to be looking at cash flow management we need to be again looking at systemization product mix all those things that we've discussed before are critically critically important because obviously it flows to, 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 to the cash position at the end of the day and and cash is king and cash is one of the most important numbers um, for a business and operating cash is so so critical to the lifeblood of the business brilliant thank you guys so cash days on to number six so we've covered some of this already but just to, to, to wrap this up uh, separately, cash days is how long it takes for cash to go through your business. So how long it comes, to, how long it takes to come back in after spending it. So effectively, this is working capital days. We're probably familiar with that as accountants. So it's looking at your debtor days plus your whip days plus your stock days or inventory days, if you want to call it inventory, um, as the new terminology is, uh, minus your creditor days. So it's it's an indication of what's going on within the business and how long it takes um, that cash to cycle through. Now, why is it important? Well, as, as we know, it gives us a good understanding of how long it takes cash to flow through the business, so we need to know that, and cash flow um, forecasting will certainly help with that as well. But in addition to that, if you have a business that is looking to grow, um, is looking to um, scale even it's looking to actually do that you can see how long it takes for the cash to come in through the business so every time they win a new piece of work or if they're, they're paying uh, to get a new piece of work you can see so for this example if we round it up it's, it takes 14 days of cash so theoretically what we're saying is we need at least 14 days worth of cash for working capital uh, for, for the business to be able to be able to be sat there and comfortably cover all of the costs um, that are due within the business. 
So when we're looking um, at scaling the business and just the general operation, again, looking at funding. So you can see how this works hand in hand with the core cash target. What funding do we need? And what is there a cash flow gap with regards to if we're looking to improve and grow and scale this business, how much do we need to find? How much funding do we actually need to be able to then be able to wash our face uh, and improve as we grow? And some of the questions here are going to be similar with regards to what we discussed with the core cash target in terms of looking at how do we bring cash in quicker? So how can your business be paid in advance? How can you leverage technology like direct debits and things? Um, can, is it possible to pay your suppliers later? Can you negotiate additional terms with the suppliers potentially if you need a bit more breathing space uh, whilst you're working on things? Is that possible as well? Uh, and again, coming back to work in progress and stock, what can you do here in terms of um, making sure that you're raising sales invoices as quickly as possible? You're only stocking stock items that actually move and not sat up as cash on the shelf uh, and that you're replacing them in a just-in-time methodology. But the, the other thing to think about here when we're looking at cash, so tax has an impact on cash as well. So it's important here to look at what is possible, what, what tax savings can we make for the client? So it's a great opportunity to do a tax review with the client to see what's possible and then making the best use of grants uh, and other incentives that they have available to them in their area potentially as well. Uh, and what basic tax um, advice can you give them? Um, again, obviously things that they will need to pay for your service to be able to access certain things, but there will be th things that you'll be able to mention to them uh, to be able to help them improve. Cash flow forecast again, have, has the business got a cash flow forecast? Do they know uh, what's going on within the business? Um, and again, coming back to the funding gap, look, look as Ainsley mentioned, looking at the funding options available, what's the cost? Is actually gonna be the best um, benefit of the business uh, and will it help the business grow and improve? So those, those are the, the main discussion points there around cash days. Ainsley, you'd like to add to anything? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's a great summary. I think we need to enforce that cash is king, that operating cash is critical, that the faster we cycle cash through the business, the better for the business. So there is no absolute right number for cash days for any particular business or industry. We can only go with benchmarking and benchmarks. But what we should be doing is driving this number down for a client. If we start with a particular position, we just need to drive that number down and down and down. Amazon, for example, will have negative number because they generally get paid before they actually have to pay any cash out to their suppliers. Um, but most businesses will have a positive cash day perspective. We need to drive that number down. So we, we should probably start with the client's terms. And if they're paying on 30 days, um, then maybe 30 days is a good number to start with. And obviously it'll probably be a lot higher even if it's 30 days credit. Um, but we should be looking at how we can drive that number down and drive it down, 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 down. So it's all the elements that go into cash days. Um, and it's looking at um, obviously whip inventory uh, debtors and creditors. So clearly we need to uh, make faster use and get our whip through the system just in time production of whatever we do from a methodology perspective. Inventory, the same thing, getting it through and selling it as quickly as possible. Debtor days, getting that cash in as quickly as possible and using and helping our clients to work with the various apps that enable that to happen. And also it's about potentially paying our customers, our, sorry, our, our suppliers as slowly as possible and holding onto our cash as long as possible within obvious uh, reasonable standards. Clearly, if we want things to happen and we want suppliers to back us, then we may need to adhere to their terms and certainly adhere to their terms. But this is about um, how we can, we can bring that number down. And um, as an organization, we used to work with our clients on cash acceleration strategies. And this is a very simple deliverable that you can do for them. This is an addition to cash flow forecasting and cash flow planning and using all those cash tools to enable that to happen and, and doing that three-way forecast to, to get a longer term strategic cash position. But cash acceleration strategies is purely about mapping how cash flows within the organization. How do we generate a sale and what are all the steps to go into generating a sale and how do we make payments to our suppliers? And how does that whole thing flow through the organization? And we can do that for WIP, we can do that for inventory, we can do that for debtors, and we can do that for our creditors or accounts payable. Um, and if we look at those and we can see how we can accelerate cash for, for uh, collecting it and how we can reasonably slow it down from a supplier's perspective, it's amazing the things that can go into play here. 
And sometimes they are not financial related. They are purely ringing the clients and making sure they're happy with our service so that they are happy to pay the bill quicker. I mean, there's just some very simple things that can be put into play and you just need to stretch your imagination about how we can make it everything happen quicker. So cash acceleration strategy day might be a great tool to be able to deliver to your clients to, to enable that to happen. So if we again, Stevie, if we just do a quick summary, I think you've been through the strategic areas. Uh, again, yeah, most, absolutely. most of our clients are going to understand cash. Um, our clients don't, but most of our, our accountants understand cash. Um, our end clients, that is, that they don't understand cash. So in very simple terms, it's how long does cash, for every pound you spend, how long does it take it to come back into the business? So it's the cash conversion cycle. It's working capital days, accounts receivable days, accounts payable days, inventory days, and work in progress all in one number. So it gives a huge, um, I suppose, number of discussion points for you to have with your clients. And clearly it's important because we need cash and we need to get cash into the business and we need to make sure that we're operating in the most cash efficient manage, um, uh, uh, way possible. And we've discussed how can we do that? We can get paid in advance. We can invoice promptly. We can get our customers paying by direct debit and using go cardless, um, or we can get our clients to think about using go cardless. Of course, all the tools that we're talking about for our clients apply to our own businesses as well. So it's important that we think about when we're discussing with our clients, how we can we improve our own business or if we have improved our own business or we do it in our own business away, then maybe we can share that with our clients so that they can understand how they can benefit from that as well. And again, looking at the strategic perspective, you'll see again, a common theme coming through here. So cash flow management and how, how that's important and how can we improve that? How can we improve the stock and, and um, work in progress? How can we bill quicker? How can we get paid quicker? Um, and how are we managing our accounts receivable and payable systems? Are we making sure that we're only paying for things that we've actually received? Are we adhering to our terms? And, and, and are we doing that in the right way possible? And again, funding becomes a, a critical discussion point here too. Brilliant, thank you, Ains. On to the last number, business oh. return. <laughs> yes. So business return, this is our take on return on capital employed. So the idea here is effectively it's the internal rate of return for the business owner or business owners if there's more than one. Um, so it's, it's making sure that they're getting a good return for their sweat equity, you know, their time, their money and effort they've invested into their business. Um, and how it's calculated, what we're doing is we're taking that operating profit, that EBITDA, we're then minusing dividends because dividends are a balance sheet item. Um, we're taking them away. And the reason for doing that is so that we can then create what we would call a level playing field with market rate salaries. Um, so, so that the, the, when the, the business is being compared, as Ainsley said, EBITDA is used to compare business to business because generally that's actually uh, the operating profit um, is comparable to across sector and so on. Um, so we can see what's going on and how people use that for making investments. But in addition to that, we need to make sure that the figure is in inclusive of market rate for what the business owner does. So that's why we take dividends away there. Now, if for any reason the business owner or business owners don't have a remuneration package that is, isn't, if it's not market rate, so they pay, you know, generally speaking in the UK, they pay themselves a small salary and the rest is dividends. If that doesn't stack up to what you would pay and employ someone to, and pay them to do the role that that business owner does, then you will need to include a market rate salary for that. And you can enter that within the Clarity platform. You've probably seen it when you're onboarding clients and obviously within the settings, you can edit that as you go along. Um, so it will either, so it's operating profit minus dividends, or if the remuneration package isn't market rate, it's minus market rate salary. So that gives us uh, what the, the standardized profit is for that business, if you want to call it that. And then what we do is we take that figure and we divide that by a deemed valuation of the business. So what we're doing there is from the research that we've seen, small businesses are typically valued at 2.5 times their EBITDA. So then we're just using that as a multiple, as a, as a valuation for the business, and then taking that operating profit minus the market rate salary or dividends, and then dividing that by the valuation. So that gives us effectively an internal rate of return for what's going on within the business. 
So generally speaking, why is it important? Well, it tells us whether the business is worthwhile or not. If it's loss making, obviously there's a problem. We don't need uh, a separate number to tell us that because we can see that there's a loss, but it just hammers home to the client again, that if the number is negative or if it's very low, you know, what should they be doing with their time? Is it really worth them pursuing this business? Are they better off um, you know, going out and getting a job? Not everybody is um, cut out for entrepreneurship, um, and potentially maybe this is something to think about but again it may well galvanize the client in terms of moving forward and actually turning the business around and making it more profitable but as we said if the number's positive there's no right or wrong number you know interest rates in the bank are very low anyway so pretty much any positive number is going to be the interest that, that you're going to get and put any money in the bank so it's a case of right what is the number now and how can we improve that so again using it as a base mark to stick in the sand to say right this is where we are now what can we do to improve the business and as you know when you play with the, those small marginal gains you make those small improvements in the numbers within the clarity platform the result kicks out all the numbers work on each other and then the business return figure kicks out what's actually in, improved for the business so you get to see that as you go through that with your clients so they can see what is possible by making those small uh, improvements and, and something for them to aim towards so certain thing this is where this number sort of brings everything all together so you're going to be looking at elements from each of the other six numbers and bringing it together for the business return here in terms of questions but certainly some things that you can look at some questions that you can ask around the business return uh it other questions around the business owner and the business owners if there's more than one in terms of what they control so where are they spending their time what are they doing day to day are they spending their time most effectively and most efficiently? Um, potentially, the business owner just wants a job. You know, is, has this business been set up for them just to have a job themselves, or do they see it actually as a real business, i.e., that it can operate without them potentially? That the business owner doesn't do everything within the business. So it's good to, to bring that to attention and have a discussion around that as well. And whether or not the, the business can actually sustain the business owner's level of income we talked about that before with the, the cash call cash target you know typically in the past i've seen that where the, the business owner tends to keep paying themselves the same amount each month regardless of what's going on with, 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 with profitability and cash within the business again they don't either don't understand numbers so they don't know to look there or they don't have time to look there so it's us bringing accountants bringing that to the client's attention to saying about what the, the, the current level um, of sustainability for what the business owner is being paid. And then also st stepping back and saying, okay, so this is where you are now. Let's just create a plan to be able to get somewhere in the future. Where do you want to get to? Bringing up all of those other elements together, using a budget, a cash flow forecast, using those as deliverables, deliverables to help the client. And more importantly, using the future area of clarity to use as a deliverable for the client and taking points off of that to show how to improve the business return figure. So I think, I think that's the, the general gist Ainsley, in terms of business returns. Anything else that you would like to, to add? Yeah, I think it's important, um, Steve, um, all the points that have been made are, are really important. And I, I think it's, it, it's, it's helpful to reiterate that it's, when we call people's babies ugly, it doesn't help. And this is a really tricky conversation to have with a small business owner about their business. But the way to tackle it would be, from my perspective, would be to talk to them about getting a true rate of return uh, relative to their risk and the amount of effort that they're putting into the business. Because most small business owners work harder than when they were employed. They fret about the business day and night. They're thinking about it 24 seven. And they've also probably invested money and they're taking a substantial risk in the business. And so they should be getting a just reward for all that effort, time, money. And when we look at that from a pure, you know, from a, without, and these numbers don't work for every business and we need to be careful when we start talking about percentages, but between five and 15%, we should be looking as, as, a, as, a, as a reasonable rate of return. So we, the business owners should be getting more than what's available in the bank for their time, effort and money and the risk. And so five to 15% should be an area that we're thinking is, is, is pretty much standard. Between 15 and 30%, the business is doing really well because that's where they're getting a good rate of return for their investment in time and money. 
And then when we get into 30% beyond, then they're skyrocketing and probably people are going to be watching what they're doing and following hot on their coattails because to generate that rate of return, then, then people will be wanting to know what they're up to and, and they will be driving competition in that area. So I think it's, it's a tricky area to have a conversation with a client on. It's important that we don't um, put them into despair, but it's important that we do show them that actually they should be getting a proper reward for their time and effort. And, and potentially this business may not be the right way for them to do that. Absolutely. And, and from a strategic perspective, we're bringing everything together. Um, but we're also looking at the more of a leadership level as well in terms of what's going on with the business. And as Ainsley said, it's important to tread carefully here. We can, the numbers tell a story, but you know, as humans, you know, Ainsley mentioned this earlier in terms of uh, systemization, 85% can be leveraged from technology and systems themselves, and the other 15% is the human element. This is where the human element comes in. So if a business isn't doing particularly well, this is where as compassionate uh, humans and empath empathetic humans, if, if we've been through this position ourselves, or if we know of other people, so we can uh, talk about experience and, and really feel what this person is going through, we can then understand and, and speak in a, in a way that is helpful and not going to kick them whilst they're down type thing uh, and really help them to empower them uh, and invigorate them to be able to move forward and do what they want to do within the business. So we're bringing together all of the other elements uh, and, and making sure that the business is doing what we're doing. And as we alluded to earlier at the start uh, of this recording is that we have accountants, we have this skill with numbers, we understand numbers and we have an ability to explain numbers. And numbers are the language of business. So it is up to us. There is an onus on us, I do believe, as accountants, to be able to use that skill, use that superpower, if you will, and then help small business owners understand their numbers and then help them improve and grow their business. So it brings it all nicely into a bow for me that this is how we actually help uh, make a dent uh, in, in the universe and help our small business owners, our, our clients to be able to get the type of life that they want. As Ainsley said, they often start their business for a reason, taking considerable risk financially um, and sacrificing lots within the, their life as well for the time and effort that they put into their business. Let's help them make this a success and get the reward that that risk and that sacrifice deserves. So that, that certainly is within our power to help our clients do that. Oh, hey, Zver, got you on mute. They have well said, Stevie. Absolutely, completely agree. And I think this is one. This one number is a key area where there's a difference between emotional intelligence and artificial intelligence. This is where computers can say one thing, but it does actually need empathy and connection to be able to properly talk through a number and to be able to explain it uh, as as a human being, um, and to, to do that in in a way that's that's going to help inspire um, and and drive change rather than 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 put people off. So thanks so much for, for uh, listening to this. What we are probably going to do is break it down into seven sections. We might have an introduction plus seven short videos. It should be uh, read, uh, uh, should be listened to as a whole because you can clearly see how the numbers interlink and we've probably had quicker conversations later on because we've, we've already had those discussions um, for another number up further up. And um, it's also important that maybe if you wanna run this for your clients, we will give you obviously access to the slides and you will have the slides, but I think it's a great webinar for you to run for your clients, the seven key numbers that you as a client must know. Um, this is about cascading education down. And so if you want to, to run this for your clients, then I would certainly, we will give you the support to be able to do that. So thanks so much for, for, for uh, listening to us and giving us your, your time. If you do want any more details, clearly you can get them from the usual sources, from our website, from our support pages, and obviously contact your usual contact at Clarity to, to get more information or follow us on social media. So thanks so much for listening and we will see you soon. Thanks, bye-bye.